If you have your Bible, turn with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 10 this morning as our opening text. James chapter 4, verse 10. James is often referred to as the Proverbs of the New Testament. It is a book filled with practical wisdom, and this verse here is another one of those wonderful, wise sayings that we can learn from and we're going to talk about this morning. James chapter 4, verse 10, and if you're able, I'd ask that you stand just briefly for the reading of God's words. We're just going to look at this one verse today out of the book of James. Scripture says, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. Very, very simple. We humble ourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt us for our humility. This morning we're going to talk a little bit about humility in our passage in Kings. Father God, thank you for today and again the opportunity, Lord, that we have to be here in this place to worship you, Lord. We have prayed, we have given up our offerings, Lord. We have lifted up our voices in praise, in admiration and exaltation of who you are. But now, Lord, we come to the part of the service where it's our turn to listen. Lord, as you speak to us through your living word. God, I pray we would have ears to hear, that we would have open hearts to apply and, and take in that which you have for us this morning. God, I just ask, Lord, that you would speak to us clearly and profoundly in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're being seated, turn back to 2 Kings chapter 20, or 1 Kings, I apologize, 1 Kings chapter 22. It is the last chapter. In fact, we are at the very end of this chapter as well. And we will continue our series on the divided kingdom era of Israel. I've got that on. Let me see if I can make it shine. Here we are. We have worked our way so far through all of the bold text, and we are here today to focus on Ahaziah and what Scripture has to say about him. Ahaziah is the son of, was the son of Ahab. He is a ruler in the northern kingdom. And we mentioned Ahaziah briefly last week when we were talking about Jehoshaphat, if you remember. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, made some bad alliances. We talked about that last week and displeased God. His alliance with Ahab was displeasing to God. And we read last week he had an alliance with Ahaziah, Ahab's son, in which the two kings came together from the northern and southern kingdoms, Judah and Israel, in order to do a joint initiative in order to build a fleet of merchant ships. You remember that? We talked about that briefly last week. It's there in 2 Kings starting in verse 47 and following. God was displeased with Jehoshaphat for once again aligning himself with the northern kingdom which was known for its sin and idolatry. And as you recall, the ships were destroyed by God's hand. So we have already mentioned Ahaziah. But this morning we're going to backtrack a little bit and, and uh, talk about uh, other aspects of Ahaziah's reign. And as we do so, we are going to encounter Elijah once again. Elijah the prophet, who we've seen during the reign of King Ahab, is still on the scene. He is still in ministry. And we will talk about Elijah and his dealings with Ahab's son Ahaziah this morning in our message. First point there on your outline, if you picked one up there in the back, is Ahaziah becomes king. Let's read the last few verses of 1 Kings here in chapter 22. It's all we have left of this book. 50, verse 51 and following. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel in Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. And he reigned two years over Israel. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the way of his father, in the way of his mother, and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. So he served Baal. He worshipped him. He provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger, according to all that his father had done. In approximately 877 B.C., Ahab was killed, as we talked about a few weeks ago in his battle to reclaim the city of Ramoth-Gilead. 
He was killed by a random arrow, and he bled out as a result of that injury. And his son, Ahaziah, became king. Ahaziah's reign began during the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. We read here in these closing verses of 1 Kings that he only reigned for two years from the capital city of Samaria there in the north. Like his father and mother, who were Ahab and Jezebel, not the greatest parents, he too was an evil king who walked in the ways of his parents and in the ways of Jeroboam. We've had evil kings since Jeroboam. Every single one of them has been evil. In fact, all of them are going to be evil on the northern kingdom side. There's not a single good one in the bunch. Ahaziah worshipped Baal, just as his parents had done. And as we will discover in this message, as it says in the last verse of 1 Kings, he provoked the Lord to anger. And we're going to see the result of this provocation in 2 Kings chapter 1. Interestingly, the book of Kings was actually originally written as a single book, the book of Kings. In fact, in Hebrew Bibles, it's still just one long book. But in our English Bibles and in other countries' Bibles, in the Christian Bible, those who canonized it back in the day separated 1 Kings and 2 Kings. They split the book of Kings into two parts. And so... We have concluded 1 Kings, and now we are moving into 2 Kings chapter 1, as we continue looking at the life of Ahaziah. The second point on your outline this morning is called Elijah's Dire Prophecy. Elijah's Dire Prophecy, 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 1. Now Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber, which was in Samaria, and became ill. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I will recover from this sickness. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Rise up, go and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beals above the God of Ekron? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, you shall not come down uh, from the bed where you have gone up, but you shall surely die. And then Elijah departed. When the messengers returned to him, they said to him, he said to them, Why have you returned? And he, they said to him, a man came up to meet us and said, Go return to the king who sent you and say to him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to acquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed where you have gone up, but you shall surely die. And he, that's the king, said to them, What kind of man was he who came up to meet you and spoke these words to you. And he answered, He was a hairy man with a leather girdle about his loins. And he said, Ah, it is Elijah the Tishbite. Verse 1 is kind of an interesting verse here as we start this chapter. It says, Now Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Moab, or after the death of Ahab. It gives us this information, and then it says absolutely nothing about it. But if you remember last week's message, when we were talking about Jehoshaphat, you remember that an alliance of the Moabites, that's Moab, the Ammonites and some others from Mount Seir and Edom came up against Jehoshaphat and invaded the southern kingdom. We talked about this last week in Chronicles, you remember? And God intervened so that they were confused and they all slayed each other and they all killed each other and, and fell dead. Well, this same Moab, who had the uh, disastrous rebellion against Jehoshaphat, apparently Moab also 
rebelled against the northern kingdom of Ahaziah. Now, I'm just going to submit to you that I would say, guessing, that the Moabites must have rebelled against Ahaziah first, because after they rebelled against Jehoshaphat, they were all dead. <laughs> God, God intervened and killed them all. But nevertheless, Moab was in rebellion, but we don't have any information about that rebellion as it pertains to the northern kingdom, because the story shifts to Ahaziah himself. So let's talk about what we've read here about Ahaziah. Ahaziah the king fell through a lattice, which is just those little, you guys know what a lattice is, one of those little cross boards that are used for support or sometimes used for like screening or walls or whatever. He fell through one in his upper chamber and as the result of the injuries he sustained, he, he got fell ill and it became very serious. And so, Wanting to know if he was going to survive this illness that had befallen him or not, we read here that he sent messengers to go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. Now, Ekron is a city, or was a city, in the area of Philistia, the Philistines. And so, he was sending his messengers from the northern kingdom south to Philistia to Ekron to inquire of their prophets there and of their false god Beelzebub whether he would recover or not. Meanwhile, verse 3, an angel of the Lord appears to Elijah. This is the same Elijah that we've talked about uh, who came on the scene during the time of Ahab. Remember, Elijah is the one who went up on uh, Mount Carmel and uh, challenged the prophets of Baal to the uh, uh, contest where they put the stuff on, uh, they put their offerings on the altar, and the prophets of Baal danced around for all day long trying to get Baal to answer them and take their offering, and he would not, and Elijah stood up. And you, you remember the story. We have seen Elijah on and off throughout these last few chapters. Elijah is still alive and well and ministering. And even though we haven't seen him in a few chapters, his name pops up again. The Lord appears to Elijah through this angel and says, Arise and go meet these messengers who the king has dispatched. And when you intercept them, ask them a question. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, of the Philistines? And then he says, tell the messengers to tell the king that he's going to die. He has not sought me, the Lord, for deliverance and salvation and healing. He has instead sought out healing from Beelzebub. No. You tell the king he's not getting up from the bed. He's going to die. So Elijah goes and intercepts the king's messengers, delivers this daunting message, and they turn around and they go back to the king. And when they get back to the king, you can see here in verse 5, the king says, uh, why have you returned? In other words, why did, how did you get back so quick? I sent you to Ekron. And you haven't had time to get to Ekron yet. Much less come back. Why, why are you back so quickly? Kind of caught by surprise. And the messengers deliver the message. They say what had happened. They said, well, we started off towards Ekron and we intercepted a man. He, he met us and said, hey, I've got the word. You don't have to go all the way to Ekron. Here's the word of the Lord. By the way, why are you going to Akron to begin with? Since there's not a God around here, you're going to die. Well, when they told the message to King Ahaziah, his response was not one of humility. His response was not one of conviction or 
submission or even fearfulness of the uh, daunting message he had just received, his response was, who was that guy that you met? What kind of man came up to you and spoke these words to you? Tell me about him. What did he look like? And the king's messenger say, well, he was a hairy man. He wore a leather girdle around him. He's kind of a wilderness man, kind of rough. We, we, we know that this is Elijah. He's a, he's a one of a kind. <laughs> they began to describe Elijah. I, I know immediately who that guy is. That's Elijah. Elijah's the same guy who gave my father so much trouble when he was alive. He was always telling him, you know, convicting him of his sin or charging him with his sin. He was not happy. Well, the thing that I would point out in this this section of scriptures is Elijah's question. Is there no God in Israel to inquire of? Of course there was a God in Israel to inquire. Elijah was being a bit sarcastic. He was known for doing that. Remember when he told the prophets of Baal, you know, that maybe Baal was asleep, they needed to scream louder? Maybe, maybe he was out to lunch, maybe he'd be back at one. Elijah was known for having a little tone about it. Is there no God that you can inquire of? Of course there's a God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of the twelve tribes of Israel, of which the northern kingdom is ten of them. Just look back at your history. Of course there is a God of Israel, the only true and living God. Jehovah God, He's the only one. Beelzebub, seriously? Beelzebub means the Lord of the flies. And at the time in 1 Kings, we're having this story, he was another of just many false deities, many derivatives of the god Baal. There was all sorts of derivatives of the god Baal. But flies were believed in ancient times to possess certain powers and qualities, and Beelzebub was the Lord of the flies. What's interesting is that over the centuries... The name Beelzebub kind of evolved and grew and became synonymous with Satan himself. In fact, in the Gospels, the Pharisees, you might remember, charged Jesus with healing, or I'm sorry, casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, which is Beelzebub. It's recorded in all three of the Gospels, Mark chapter 3, Luke chapter 11. I'm going to read just a little bit from Matthew chapter 12. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man, talking about Jesus, cast out demons by, by, by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. That is the derivative of Beelzebub. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and any city or house divided against itself against itself will not stand. So if Satan cast out Satan, then he is divided against himself. How will this kingdom stand? If I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. And it goes on. The point is that Beelzebub is a false pagan god who comes to represent Satan and Ahaziah is seeking out his counsel rather than that of the Lord. Beloved scripture tells us that God is a jealous God. We need to be careful. God is a jealous God. We're going to see his jealousy provoked as we continue. The third point this morning is called fire from heaven. We pick up the story in verse 9. Then the king, that is Ahaziah, having discovered this is Elijah the Tishbite, sent, a cap, sent to him a captain of fifty with his fifty. And he went up to him, and behold, he was sitting on top of the hill. And he said, O oh, man of God, the king says, Come down. And Elijah replied to the captain of fifty, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty. And then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Huh. So he, that is the king, 
again sent to him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he said to him, O man of God, thus says the king, come down quickly. And Elijah replied to them, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. So again, <laughs> he, the king, sent a captain of a third fifty with his fifty. And when the third captain of fifty came up, he came and he bowed down on his knees before Elijah and begged him and said, O oh, man of God, please let my life and the lives of these fifty servants of yours be precious in your sight. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the first two captains and their well, fifties with their fifties. But now let my life be precious in your sight. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with them, do not be afraid of them. So he rose and went down with them to the king. And then he said to him, Thus saith the Lord, Because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there is no God in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore, you shall not come down from your bed where you have gone up, but you shall surely die. The king's messengers have come back to Ahaziah, and they've said, we've got this really hairy dude, had on some rough clothes, he told us, king, that you're, you're going to die. The king says, oh, that's Elijah. And you know what? He was a thorn in my a thorn in my daddy's side, and now he's a thorn in my side. I'm not putting up with him. And so what does he do? He dispatches a captain with 50 armed soldiers. Now listen. If you have tranquil, peaceful intentions, you don't need to send a captain with 50 armed soldiers. We can read from the context that King Ahaziah had malicious intent. He was going to either go arrest Elijah or possibly even have Elijah killed. He was furious. And so he dispatches a captain over 50 men and we read here that the captain and the 50 men go to find Elijah and when they find him, Elijah is perched up on top of a hill. And the captain looks up the hill and demands by, by the king's authority that the Elijah that Elijah come down. He says, Oh man of God, come down. Now I want to be real clear here. When he calls Elijah man of God, that's very similar to when the Romans nailed a placard above Jesus' cross that said, King of the Jews. He is not acknowledging Elijah as a true prophet of God, nor is he acknowledging Jehovah as the true God of Israel. He is mockingly using the title, Oh man of God, the king says, get down here. But notice Elijah's response. Well, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your men. And what happens? Fire comes down from heaven and consumes he and his men. Well, I don't know exactly who, but I imagine somebody saw what happened and rushed back and told the king because it says when Ahaziah found out, he said, Arrgh! I added that part. He said, I'm going to send another captain with 50 more men. I'm going to get this sucker. He sends out captain number two with his 50 men and they come to the mountain or to the hill and Elijah's still sitting on the hill. You know what that tells me? Elijah wasn't scared. I'm not going anywhere. He can send a million men if he wants to. I'm sitting right here on this hill. Here comes group number two and here comes arrogant captain number two. Oh man of God! The king said come down quickly! You better get down this hill. And Elijah says, same song, second verse. If I'm a man of God, 
Let fire fall down from heaven and consume you and your fifty. And what happens? Fire falls from heaven and consumes him and his fifty. Now, I don't know if you're keeping score, but if you include Kent Mount Carmel, which we talked about a few weeks ago, and then these first two accounts, Elijah three times in his ministry had fire fall from heaven. I think that's a record in the Bible. Word gets back to the king. You would think that after losing two captains plus a hundred foot soldiers, the king might employ a new strategy. Nope. You ever known anybody who just beats their head against that same wall over and over again? It's like, stop! Maybe that's somebody you know is you. Sometimes we're a little slow in figuring things out. What do they say? Do the same thing over and over and expecting different results is the definition of what? Insanity? Is that what the saying is? Isaiah calls up another captain, another 50 men, and he sends out a third group. And they go, and Elijah's still sitting on that same field. But this time, something different. The third captain says here in verse 13, came and bowed down on his knees before Elijah and begged him, Oh, man of God. Let me pause right there. When he said man of God, he meant it. He's the first of the three to really mean it. Oh, man of God, please let my life and the lives of these 50 servants be precious in your sight. He cited what had happened previously to the two previous groups of men, and he pleaded with Elijah, please spare us. You see what happened here in verse 15? The angel of the Lord appeared to Elijah and told him, go down with them. Don't be afraid. And Elijah went with him and was subsequently taken to the king. And upon his arrival, Elijah boldly rebuked King Ahaziah for the same thing he had said to the messengers, for inquiring the word from Beelzebub rather than from God. And again, he stated, without reservation, because you have done that, you will die. As I said, the Lord is a jealous God. He is provoked and he is offended when we seek out other gods rather than him. He is our creator. He is our sustainer. He is our provider. He is our protector. Everything we have, every breath, every beat of our heart, it's because of him. And he is just and right to be angry when we look elsewhere other than him. And it's especially egregious when we should know better. This is not some pagan foreign nation. This is Israel. They are descendants of Abraham. They should know better. But they don't. Well, let's look at the last point here this morning. Ahaziah dies as predicted. Verse 17 and 18. So Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. And because he had no son, Jehoram became king in his place in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of Chronicles, the kings of Israel? So in the days that followed, after Elijah had come and delivered the message face to face to the king. What happened? Ahaziah died. Are we surprised? No. Just as Elijah had spoken that he would. What we discover in these last verses is that Ahaziah did not have any sons. And so Jehoram, who was his brother, another of Ahab's sons, became king in his place, Ahaziah only reigned for two brief years. Jehoram replaced him as king of Israel. 
It says here that Ahaziah died and his brother was coordinated as the new king during the 18th year of Jehoshaphat. That's what it says in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 1. In this verse, it says that he was, that he died, and Jehoram became king in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat in Judah. Now let's take a minute to process that. It was the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, and because my slide breaks off here, the very next one, the top of the next slide, is going to be Jehoram. It says it was the second year of Jehoram. So which was it? Was it the 18th year of Jehoshaphat in Judah, or was it the second year of Jehoram in Judah? The Bible's wrong. No, it's not. It was an ancient practice that oftentimes, when a king got older, or if he had health problems, or any other compelling reason, he would name his son as co-regent, so that there would be a period of time where both of them were kings, that would overlap so that he could train his son, if you will, and prepare his son so that when he died, his son would then be the sole king again. So it was the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, which was the second year of Jehoram, meaning that they had started overlapping. This part of the scripture, this particular section, Owen, can you go back there and hit the down arrow key one time? This particular section gets a bit confusing, and so I'm going to take a second before we close to, to explain this, because over the next few weeks I'm going to use some of these names and it gets confusing. Jehoshaphat we have talked about. Ahab we have talked about. Ahab had three children that are named in the Bible. His daughter was named Adaliah. Adaliah was the sister of Ahaziah, who we've talked about this morning, who became king when Ahab died, because he was the oldest son. Ahaziah had no children of his own, as we just read. So when Ahaziah died, Jehoram, his younger brother, also the son of Ahab, became king in his place. And we'll talk about Jehoram uh, in the coming weeks. Jehoram took Ahaziah's place. Okay? But you also remember that we kept talking about Jehoshaphat getting in trouble because of his alliances with Ahab. And one of the things he did is he had his son, Jehoram, marry Ahab's daughter, Athaliah, so that she became queen in the southern kingdom, though she was the daughter of Ahab in the northern kingdom. Also, something else I'll point out. Jehoshaphat's son was named Jehoram. Ahab's son was named Jehoram. And this Jehoram and this Jehoram, two separate people, both served as king at the same time in their respective kingdoms. Meaning that when you read in Scripture, if you're not careful, it's very easy to confuse which one is which. I'm hoping this diagram helps us kind of sort it out. It gets worse. <laughs> because we're going to discover that this Jehoram and his wife Adaliah had a son that they named Ahaziah, which is a distinct different person than the Ahaziah we talked about this morning. In fact, this Ahaziah who just died at the end of chapter 1, was the uncle of this Ahaziah, which we'll get to in a few weeks when we talk about Judah. By the time he is on the throne, his uncle has long since been deceased. But you can see there's common names, there's interconnected family, and this whole section can get jumbled up real easy in your mind if you don't keep it straight. And that's why I wanted to put this diagram up here, this kind of this uh, family tree, to help keep it straight. Now, here's the interesting thing. Every single one of these people rules at some point. In Judah, it's going to go Jehoshaphat, then Jehoram, then Ahaziah, 
And then there's going to be a period where Queen Athaliah takes over. Not a good period, because remember, she comes from bad roots. We're going to get there. Meanwhile, Ahab, Ahaziah, Jehoram is the order that they fall in the northern kingdom. That's a lot of extra information, but hopefully that helps keep it straight. Let's bring it back to a close and talk about the text today as we apply it to our lives and why it's in the Bible. Because it's not just there so that we can learn information or history. Everything there is there to teach us something. And so what can we learn from today's text? Well, here's how it speaks to me. King Ahaziah, though he was a wicked, idolatrous man, what he wanted, what he desired, was a message of hope. He desired good news about life and restoration and healing and deliverance. And beloved, I don't care who you are, don't we all want to hear that message? We all want to hear that message. But here's the problem. Rather than turning to the giver of life, rather than turning to his creator, rather than turning to the God who offers salvation through his son, instead he turned to Beelzebub, a false god, or even over time comes to represent Satan himself. He turned to the gods of this world. He turned against the true living God, and he sought life, he sought restoration, he sought salvation somewhere else. And because of his idolatry, because of his sin, because of his misplaced faith, the Lord decreed that he would certainly die. And when the messenger of God came and delivered this unsettling truth, Rather than falling under conviction, rather than bowing his knee before the Lord and saying, Lord, forgive me for my sin, rather than repenting, what did he do? He decided to rail against and rail against God's prophet and God. Why? For speaking the truth. Aren't you glad that doesn't happen today? Ultimately, King Asai died. But it wasn't just him, because sin never just affects one. So did the first and second commanders and each of their 50 men, because they, likewise, following their king's example, did not recognize, respect, or revere the authority of God or the word of his prophet. The one person in this story that we need to focus on, the one person in this story who is the key figure is the third commander. He alone acknowledged the Lord, recognized Elijah as a true man of God, bowed down before him in humility and pleaded for his life and the life of his soldiers. You see, he was the only one who did not turn elsewhere for salvation, like the king did. He's the only one who did not arrogantly discount or demean or belittle God's prophets, like the first commander did. He's the only one who did not foolishly overlook the clearly demonstrated power of God like the second commander did. He's the only one who bowed the knee and humbled himself before the Lord. Beloved, we are all dying. We have fallen through our own spiritual lattices and our sin is killing us. 
We need deliverance. We need life. And there's only one true source of forgiveness and redemption. Rather than seeking other futile alternatives like Ahaziah did, rather than railing against the truth and seeking to harm those who speak it, like the first commander did, rather than ignoring the abundant, overwhelming evidence of God's existence and His almighty power, which is confirmed on a near daily basis by things that go on in this world, which has been confirmed by history, which has been confirmed by science, which has been confirmed year after year by geological and geographical discoveries, beloved, which is confirmed by our own personal testimonies of what God has done in our life, rather than ignoring the fire that falls every single day by our powerful, visible God, who reveals himself to the world constantly rather than denying it, rather than seeking futile alternatives, rather than railing against the truth and those who speak it. Why don't we? Why don't we instead humbly bow like the third commander did before the Lord and plead for life, plead for forgiveness, Plead for salvation that only He offers. Friends, I've got good news for you. Scripture says that God will extend favor to and He will spare those who humbly submit and surrender their lives to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. Humble yourself before the Lord, and He will exalt you. Will you trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior today? Father God, as we close today's service once again, I am moved by the way that your word constantly speaks. Lord, it never grows old. And as we sang this morning, I love to tell the story. I love to tell it. For some have never heard the message of salvation. And even for those who know it best, we seem hungering and thirsty to hear it like the rest. Because it is the word of life. God, I pray that we would be a humble God, that we would be those who recognize and embrace our weaknesses, our dependence upon you, and that we would rest in you. Lord, and share your good news to everyone that we can in humility and grace, that they might know the same Jesus that we know. God, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning during this time of invitation that needs to respond to you in any way, that they will do so in obedience with your will. For we ask it in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ.